Okay, it is the top of the hour, so we're going to welcome everyone. We've got a good number of people online, so please try to keep yourselves muted. Uh, we will be monitoring that and muting attendees if need be, but we, we do welcome you today. Salam will be um, introducing himself and starting the presentation in just a moment, but I did want to mention up front that if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we should have time at the end for Q&A. And if necessary, we'll stick around after two o'clock and answer any questions that didn't get answered during the hour. So feel free to, uh, to ask those questions at the end, but hopefully it's within the one to two time period. Uh, and then from a logistics standpoint, letting you know that we do plan to convert the slides to a PDF and share that with everyone who registered for today. So, um, and this is Seal Strauss speaking. I'm the state flood play manager, and I'll probably be the one sharing the slides with everybody who registered. So at this point, turning it over to Salam and appreciate him being a speaker on on an update of a presentation we gave last year. Yeah, thank you, Seal, and thank you all for attending uh, this webinar on better culverts and crossings training. And I just want to say this is a teamwork um, that involves me and Kevin Zetkovich, but I'll be presenting today, you know, both of our works. And this is the outline of the presentation. Uh, I will be introducing the geomorphic approach uh, from a geomorphology basis and also from hydraulic uh, basis, and then talk about four uh, case studies uh, that uh, in Rock County, Lincoln, Olmsted, and Traverse, and then also provide an update about the cost share grant program that now we're administering. So to start with, you know, what is geomorphic approach? Uh, basically, it's a design for crossings and bridges that incorporates the backfill hydraulic geometry. Uh, for the purpose of maintaining river stability, flow continuity, natural system functions, and infrastructure resiliency. So the geomorphic approach helps us understand the natural stable conditions of a stream, and that becomes the basis for the design because we want to maintain that stream stability as much as possible, you know, once we uh, introduce the proposed conditions to it. So it requires the understanding of fluvial uh, geomorphology, which is the study of the interactions between the physical shapes of river, their water and sediment transport processes and the landforms they create. And, and you can learn a lot about those things if you attend like the Dave Roskin classes. He has like level one through four, and, and those are good in introducing you to geomorphology. And then, you know, once we introduce those uh, bankful metrics, we go through um, the hydrologic and, hyd and hydraulic uh, iterative modeling that way we can put the proposed condition in, in the model and then be able to quantify the key improvements and the, and the results. And then once we have that done, we'll, we'll submit the hydraulic proposal and then it turns into a design. So there's a lot of give and take in the process. So I just want to say that the geomorphic approach is based on the premise that protecting and maintaining natural river functions as the basis for the design increases longevity of the crossings, decreases the flood risk while protecting ecological functions of the natural system. If we don't do that, there'll be some problems on the landscape as we see happening. And, and here, this is a, a map, a detailed study area map, and you can see the special flood hazard areas upstream and downstream of a crossing. And because of the confinement imposed by this crossing, we see a disconnection right here, and that's causing the SFHA area, the special flood hazard area, to actually expand upstream. So that disconnection causes a lot of problems uh, in terms of sediments, in terms of stream stability, and, and we can see that you know, in, in our fields. In, in this case, on the left, it is an over-widened um, uh, opening and and so what happens when the river you know uh, upstream of that overwidened crossing you know there'll there'll be low energy um, and low velocity low shear stress and that's going to cause a lot of the sediment to deposit like we see over here so you end up actually losing a lot of capacities of these uh, openings over time and you can see it on the right where you know the channel wants to form its own bankful metric as you can see here and it acts as the middle part and it forms a deposition up to near bankful areas, as you hear, as you see here. You can see there's a guy who put a hammock over here. Maybe he knows a little bit about geomorphology. He thinks he's safe. I wouldn't bet on it though, but 
this is another site. Uh, we were involved in the letter of map revision in Cascade uh, in Olmsted County, uh, city of Rochester. And, and this crossing on 45th Street was upstream of the restoration site. So, you know, we were getting the survey uh, submitted to us. We only had one point, you know, we didn't get the survey on the left and right for a good reason, because you have all these sediment forming. So it, it's, it's kind of interesting and it's, it's also a flood risk because the effective model that's there right now assumes that all of the bridge is actually conveying. It assumes that, um, you know, when we have big storms, it's going to blow everything into it and you have full access. In, real, in, in reality, that's not what's happening. You actually have a constriction causing overtopping and an increase in base flood elevations. So in order to put the existing conditions in the model, you have to account for these uh, uh, permanent sediments actually, and it causes uh, it caused an increase in the base flood elevation as part of the better data submission submittal. So we see that all over, like upstream and downstream for oversized culvert, where you're actually losing money because you're losing cross section area, you're losing the capacity to transport all these flows. And it, it does affect the longevity of the uh, structure, as you see. On the other hand, if you do undersized channel culverts, you, you have different type of scenarios where you have perched uh, uh, chan, uh, culverts uh, causing high velocities and, and a lot of um, erosion, as you can see here on, on the left and right. So the basis of the geomorphic approach is actually to define and determine what these bankful metrics are. So we have an, a, a geomorphic assessment form that does that. And, and this is the version that we're using right now when it's uploaded. We actually are improving uh, this. We're working with uh, Aaron Lam actually is working with us to improve it uh, so that we can and use it to uh, include more information that could help with the geomorphic assessment of the sites. So what kind of information do we get from the you know, bankfall uh, from the geomorphic assessment? One key one is the bankfall depth, which is the, the bankfall depth is the point where the natural stable system overtops its bank, and that's when we see it activate the, the floodplain. So that's a really key info, uh, information to have. The other one is the bankfall width, which is the width of the channel at which it starts to overtop and activate the floodplain. And then the floodplain uh, width or the flood prone width, which is another a similar term that can be used, is the width of the active floodplain where we can actually put floodplain culverts that can convey a lot of these uh, floodplain flows. And then other information we get is like the floodplain elevation upstream and downstream. We want to know what the river sinuosity is, the channel floodplain slopes, the, how much it's unstable, you know, the bank height ratio, for example, gives us the depth of incision, the road top, and then the sag elevations. So it's really all about ensuring a connected system. It's all about connectivity. And then when we talk about connectivity, we talk about it in the longitudinal sense, you know, where, where the water flows through the channel. And then we talk about lateral uh, sense, where there's an interaction be between the channel and its left and right overbanks. So the premise of this is, that you know the bank for right and left and the channel act as one unit and in that unit we have to design for each one separately we have to account for the flows through the channel and then we have to account for the flows through the overbanks and as as part of that design and and the geomorphic approach will sort of show us how how this can be done and and the geomorphic uh, assessment form in detail it it's basically summarizes site information uh, existing structure in terms of, uh, you know, how much freeboard we have uh, and, uh, you know, what's the uh, cross-sectional area and, and uh, related information. And then you come here to the, the bankful information. And then and it has some uh, like stream stat discharges and uh, a lot of sediment related. So it, it basically summarizes sort of like the, the imprints of the channel so that we can base the design on it. You, you probably are familiar with the regional curves. There's uh, there are regional curves for Western and Eastern and Minnesota streams, and that can give us an idea about what those bankful metrics are. And it gives us the ballpark. And then of course we have to go to the field and be able to verify what those bankful measures are in the field. But this is how we start, you know, with, with sort of the desktop exercise of introducing what these bankful metrics are. 
And of course, this shows the bankful depth of a drainage area. The one that I showed previously cross sectional based on drainage area, and then we have the width based on the drainage area. And, and those are all uh, shared on, on the uh, river ecology unit uh, website. So now to sort of uh, transform the geomorphic approach into the actual uh, physical attributes of the stream, the bankful width represents the channel width. That's where the opening should be in the channel. The bankful depth represents the elevation where we where the floodplain is active, and that's the elevation where we have to put the floodplain culvert. And we've seen floodplain culvert in, in the field with actually placed too low. If it's actually placed like below the bankful depth, we'll start seeing deposition and the culvert will lose its capacity because the river knows what its bankful width is and it's going to activate this. And then the floodplain should be activating the floodplain culvert. And then the placement of these floodplain culverts should be within the floodplain width or the flood prone width. So that's how we get this information from geomorphic assessment form and try to uh, put it in the model and then be able to introduce what the design should be. And you, you can go to our website. You, you can just put key, uh, keywords, uh, North Minnesota DNR geomorphology. It takes you right here and, and you see a lot of designed resources and reports that you can use. And then some other references like fluvial process and geomorphology by Luna. And then uh, there's a lot, a lot of river science series of training. I mentioned uh, Dave Roskin uh, level uh, courses. That's a good uh, source. Also the website uh, that and then always talk to us. You know, we can meet always with you as we do, you know, on a daily basis. So some common uh, situations to consider using geomorphic approach when a culvert or bridge is blown out. And we've seen that happen like in big storm where presiden presidential disasters have been declared. Uh, road overtopping uh, occurring during severe storm events, high maintenance culverts, uh, one that continually fill with sediment, as I showed earlier in some of the photos, and then redesigning for higher flows as part of a community master plan, especially now a lot of them when they review the hydrology uh, for FEMA submittals, they have to apply the Atlas uh, 14 flows so they, they would have to redesign for higher flow so that the river doesn't overtop, especially if it's an emergency route and it's not supposed to do that. And then any road project where sufficient embankment exists so that you can you know, fit these floodplain culverts. In size channel contributing excessive sediments from bank erosion, road where with a floodplain higher on the upstream side or like the downstream side, and then stream with heavily eroded channel due to concentrated flows on downstream side of the road. Basically, if you see a disconnection at a crossing, that's an indication that uh, you should apply the geomorphic approach so that you can mimic as much as possible what the natural channel conditions of the stream is. And then that's how uh, you can, uh, you know, uh, assign and propose your, uh, your conditions. So it's a river come first basis type of design. And then the benefits are, of course, maintains channel stability, reduces erosion, improves aquatic and terrestrial passage and stream corridors. The, the terrestrial passage applies to the flop and culver, culverts where, where, you know, like turtles can pass through those and access them. Reduce risk of infrastructure damage, safety and prevention of road overtopping, reduce flooding, compliance with floodplain ordinance. You know, if, if there's a road that is designated an emergency route, it's not supposed to overtop in the floodplain, in the floodplain ordinance, so you need to comply with that ordinance requirement. And then improves the climate change resiliency. And I think the climatology office adopted the geomorphic approach as part of improving uh, climate resiliency. And, and they showed actually our link on, on their website too. So this is sort of illustrates the process where the first thing it starts is the geomorphic assessment. And then uh, we do iterative hydraulic analysis. And then we qualify this with field survey site constraints. You know, there's a lot of that, like, you know, a lot of submitters, they don't want flop and cover to be placed further away from the bridge, especially if their bridge is like 10 feet wide. They want to place them close as much as possible so that it can form as a one bridge per state aid requirement, for example. That can happen too, and that's a site constraint or requirement. And then once this is done, we introduce it as a design and then and it does go back and forth and until the implementation. So now how does it work hydraulically in hydraulic sense? In this illustration, you see an over widened channel culvert, and we know that there's going to be the positions on this side as we normally see. We have a cross sectional area. So you see here that all the flow is actually confined hydraulically 
into one opening. All of the flow in the left overbank, right overbank, um, which is supposed to be the floodplain flow, is actually ineffective. There's no flow here, just standing water. So imagine all the velocities and higher flows just flowing into one big opening. In a geomorphic approach, we try to distribute this cross-section area along the floodplain, where the opening of the channel is the bank for width. We place floodplain culverts at the bank for depth, and by using the same cross-sectional area, we get improvements. And as I mentioned, uh, hydraulically, it works the best if you actually uh, locate these floodplain curves further away so that you can take advantage of the expansion upstream uh, to uh, minimize ineffective flow as much as possible. In the real world, so far, we know that's not going to be the case. A lot of people would want to put these closer for uh, budgetary uh, concerns. But this is how it works, and this is the planar view of it. You can see all the effective flow is confined into one point and you know and uh, causing a lot of problems here whereas in a geomorphic approach you actually distribute it as much as possible you know so that you can allow for flopping conveyance while ensuring uh, channel flows and you can see it right here in this illustration where this is a 2d model or srh 2d actually you can see all the flows going into one area right here so this is handling all the velocities and um, shear stress where we're actually in a model you can see it distributed all around. So you're actually minimize your uh, velocities and shear in this area. And indeed we can quantify this in, in terms of uh, shear along the cross section uh, upstream of the, uh, the bridge where the red denotes the traditional way where everything is confined. And then once you impose the geomorphic approach, you can see that the peaks reduce and some of the floodplain conveyance is, is becoming activated and, and taking part in distributing flow. And you see a 40% uh, shear stress reductions, and we do see a reduction in water surface elevation. And the, the key parameters that we quantify, uh, water surface elevation, that's very important for uh, FEMA uh, submittals. We also look at velocities, we look at shear stress, uh, erosion, and connectivity in terms of the energy gradient slope and sediment transport. And as you know from the energy equations, you know, the energy gradient line uh, represents the pressure flows, dynamic flows, and the uh, static flows. So, you know, when you have confinement uh, through crossing, you see a sudden change in that energy gradient line due to the, uh, the head losses here as it expands and contracts. So we want to be able to minimize this and be able to sustain like a connected system as much as possible. And we actually use the energy gradient line to measure how much connected the stream is. And for modeling, mostly we use uh, like FEMA approved models that we have in hand that we can work with. For preliminary cases, you know, we use the steady state 1D RAS model, and this is just to introduce the concept. And, and then we can get more involved as the project is implemented by using 2D RAS, uh, you know, uh, SRH 2D. Uh, we use this for hydro hydrology, XP swim. We, we used Geisha. And of course, the gauge uh, analysis is really important. So now I want to introduce uh, four case studies in Rock County. That's our signature project that we started with. And then Lincoln County, Olmsted County, and Traverse County. Lincoln and Olmsted are important ones because we recently or tentatively awarded them the 25% cost share. So I'll be talking about uh, you know, what they submitted and what if improvements did we see from their projects. Uh, before they build it, of course. So now to the Rock Creek, our signature project. This is a tributary to the Rock River in, in Rock County. Uh, the problem, they were doing stream restoration upstream, and we have two oversized uh, arches, like you see here. And, and you can see the channel coming from the left uh, at an angle, and then there's a lot of deposition happening here. And that's an in-house project. Uh, Jean Lohr actually did a lot of the surveying and, and the design of, of this project, he was the coordinator on it. And the existing two arches were 10 by 6.5. So we want to apply the geomorphic approach and instead put a, a bottomless, which work actually really good, bottomless uh, box culvert, uh, 12 by 6. As you can see here, 12 is the bankful width. It's covered, but uh, it's a bankful width. So we apply the same uh, width for the opening. And then we introduce three arches on the floodplain, 3.5 times three floodplain culverts. And this is sort of the schematic of it. 
And we did a 2D model, you know, because they were kind of constructed to study the interactions, um, you know, between the overbanks and the channel. And you can see here how the flood plane covers are being activated. And we did see a lot of benefits. This is the profile upstream, downstream. This is where the crossing is. We did get a reduction in the water surface elevation, as you can see here. And notice the, the sudden drop, it, it's much more continuous when you do the geomorphic approach uh, compared to the sudden drop in the existing condition. And this is the, the shear stress uh, along the profile. And you can see with the red, the existing shear stress, and you can see the drop when we applied the geomorphic approach. So we saw that improvement. And I think this the project was built around 2017 and it's still performing good. There's no more sediment issues. The landowner is really happy. And last time when the crew went out there, they actually observed, witnessed a bankful condition taking place. And they, they send us photos and you can see the floodplain culvert actually activating the flow. So, so we know that, that it's working and it's, it's very successful. And the next case study is the, uh, the Yellow Medicine and the County Road 8. And we recently, recently approved this project. It's pending, you know, to do the formalize the agreement. And this is in Lincoln County along the Yellow Medicine. And basically, as you can see here on the right and left, uh, the river splits into northern and southern uh, tributaries until they meet again downstream. Uh, this was sort of a man-made effort to do this, and it's causing some issues. So they want to basically uh, disconnect the southerly one and have everything flow into the northern one. And so there's a culvert here, and, and instead of you know doing away with the culvert, uh, we said, you know, why don't you replace it and use it as a floodplain culvert and only allow like uh, above bankful flows to take place as a swale through it. So the north reach existing is 10 by 6. Uh, so we, in order to have all the flow go to the northern part, we propose two 16 by 6, 16 being the bankful width. And then we uh, propose a bankful culvert here. And there's an old buried floodplain culvert that they need to replace with a new one, which is 73 by 45 inches. And then this would be like another floodplain culvert. So we did a split flow type uh, 1D model, as you can see on the left. And of course, everything is based on the geomorphic uh, assessment form. And we did get some benefits. This is upstream. Now, once you divert everything upstream, the flows actually going to double in size because you're minimizing the flows through the southerly floodplain culvert. So even the doubling of flow, we actually reduce the velocity uh, because we replaced the flopping the channel culvert to fit with the uh, the bankful width, and then apply the you know the flopping culverts to um, to flow the the floodplain elevations. So we we saw reductions in velocity, we saw reductions in shear stress. Now the next one we recently approved this. This is the county state eight highway three, and Cascade Creek in Olmsted County. And uh, this is upstream of the Cascade. It's not an SFHA area over here. And you can see from Google Earth, you know, the Cascade as it flows from left to right, it's an overwidened, you know, uh, we knew that uh, when we did the geomorphology, I mean, the geomorphic uh, assessment. And we know we can see that there's some sediment actually blocking uh, some of these uh, openings on the left and right. Uh, and then you can see some erosion taking place on the south. So if you can see it in photos, this is the downstream end where you see an overwidening, and this is the upstream end where you see a lot of deposition. So this is uh, like a quintessential site that would actually apply where to apply the geomorphic approach to. Uh, so we did the geomorphic assessment, applied it to design and the modeling, and this shows the schematic where we have an overwidening 30 foot wide bridge. And what we want to do is reduce it to a 16 foot wide channel and then for the other openings, we'll put floodplain culvert at bank full depth for the proposed condition. And, and the result is we did see a reduction in the uh, water surface elevation for the 10 year. And we actually did see a reductions in the velocities. This is the profile and this is where this, this stream is. And we saw some significant reductions. I would say 22 is significant, you know, for the 10%. And we saw 40% reductions in the shear stress. So that's going to help a lot with the sediment issue where it, before it was between 2 and 2.5. Now it's between 1 and 1.5. So the, the other fourth example is in Traverse County, Taylor Township. 
this is a good example of consecutive culvert replacement. We, we want these type of uh, systems to evaluate. And this happened in 2019. Uh, as you know, if you remember, you know, we had a, like a, a huge storms on the western and south part of the state. And there was a presidential declaration issued on um, June 12, 2019 uh, for 20, 51 counties. And we actually worked with Walton One uh, as part of this declaration. And then we worked in Traverse County where Julie Adlin, uh, who's the area hydrologist at the time, called us you know, to, to look at the site. Uh, these are all the red spots in the site. We picked one. And if you can see on this scale, there's a con consecutive crossings right here. And this is the site of concern, CR9. And there's a private road here. There's 70, 770th Street. We found out that the private road actually was the one that's controlling the flows on the site, you know, and that was something that we had to address in order to fix the problem here. So we had wanted to, to do a 2D model. And uh, and so we did a HMS model to, to get a hydrograph uh, using the Atlas 14 rainfall. And then compare three scenarios, existing culverts, as you see here, and then the county proposed culverts uh, where they um, improve the situation over the existing uh, condition. And then we apply the geomorphic approach. And now I'll show you sort of in some kind of animation, you know, um, to compare, you know, all the different scenarios. Uh, this is the ground elevation, upstream, downstream. This is the CR9, our side. This is the driveway, and this is the other crossings. This is the no bridge scenario. You know, when we have no bridges as much as possible, we, we try to simulate it, you know, with the sediment already forming, you know, we, uh, we run the model and this is the scenario we have. This is the existing condition and, and see the drive risk actually controlling the CR9 conditions. Uh, so we had to address this before. You can see the sudden um, drops in water surface elevation because of the crossings. This is the county proposed for CR9 driveway and 770th Street, which is an improvement. And, and they want to tackle the overtopping basically of uh, over CR9 and, and some of the tailwater effects that's happening here. And then when we applied the geomorphic approach only in CR9, we got improvement to where it's not overtopping anymore. And of course, we use LIDAR. So uh, we don't have the actual surveys. We use LIDAR, but the surveyed areas of the crossings. So we did get improvements on CR9. Now, when we apply that geomorphic approach to the driveway and 770th Street, we, we get actually more improvement to where we're actually mimicking almost the natural conditions. So this shows sort of the localized improvement in addressing ge geomorphic approach on one crossing versus the cumulative Im improvement when you address connectivity in the whole system, because it is, it's a system issue and it does work in one, but it works better if you address all the different confinement. And I want to acknowledge the team. You know, we started 10 years ago, uh, Kevin and I working on these side by side, presenting everywhere, you know, from Water Resource Conference to MINAFM twice or three times, the Association of the MOD, Minnesota Association of Watershed Districts, and, and other in house presentations. So we, we developed a lot of these sites thanks to the area hydrologist, clean water specialist who helped us and they're still helping us today in bringing these sites to us and then connecting us with these communities that need it. So it's an ongoing uh, work. And now I wanna talk a little bit about the cost share program. You know, as I mentioned, Kevin and I started 10 years ago and it culminated into a bill that passed uh, July uh, 1st this year and we were excited about it. And you can find a lot of information on the geomorphic uh, approach website. But basically, they allocated $1 million first year, $1 million the second year for providing technical financial assistance for county and local governments to replace failing or ineffective culverts using modern designs that restore flooding connectivity, biological connectivity, and channel stability. So those are key words, you know, connectivity, biological and channel, and then the stability. And then this appropriation is available for up to two additional years. And we want to make it successful so that they can keep, uh, you know, renewing this bill uh, every two years and, and giving us more money because we are really getting more sites than the money that is available for it. And that's a really good thing. And to break this language more, you know, it, it talks about Minnesota's public road intersects the state's natural perennial flowing water courses, approximately 65,000 locations. 
So all these you know, crossing and bridges are bisecting all these natural streams, causing a lot of sediment issues. And that sort of was the premise. Many of the culverts at these locations are failing and require replacement. A culvert replacement and incentive program would provide financial and technical assistance for counties and other local governments to modernize culvert systems to address. And these are key words, the buzzwords, climate resiliency, restore fish communities, and reduce sediment loads. And this proposal will accelerate the adoption of alternative culvert designs that improve biological connectivity, channel stability, reduce flood stage, and lower long-term maintenance cost. So it's a win-win situation for all who are involved. So the advantages of the cost share grant is to promote the geomorphic approach by applying it to more sites. You know, we want to engage the communities out there, uh, engage consultants, uh, in addition to the area hydrologists and clean water specialists who we work with. So we want to open that dialogue and we want to provide, based on the bill, 25% cost share of the construction cost. And of course, the construction cost is based on the, the bids that comes in later. So at the final design phase, we would set the money aside and then we will wait for the bids to come and then 25% will apply to the bids, depending on funds availability. And then we want an opportunity to collaborate outside of DNR. You know, we, we want to get the, the consultant perspective who some actually worked with us, but we, we want to you know, learn with them and you know, the best modeling approaches, you know, what models they use, and, and you know, it, it could be an excellent collaboration. And then uh, we want to work to improve geomorphic approach, you know, fine tune it even more. And also we're conducting, um, SAFL is conducting some research. Uh, we're working with Jessica and Matt uh, Hernick and Jessica Kuzarek. Uh, they're doing some flume bed experiments to study floodplain culverts more. And we're giving them a lot of information, assessment, uh, assessment form that they can use in their research. And we formally launched the SHARE uh, grant program in around mid-November. And we got so many sites. We had 14 sites submitted. Two of them we could not approve. One of them was in the, was just to be constructed. So we didn't have time to actually assess it during the design phase. Another one did not have a floodplain to it. It was like a beast type channel without any floodplain or connection. But everything else, you know, it's being tentatively approved. We awarded Lincoln, Olmsted. Uh, we're going to be awarding one in Dakota County soon. So we're actually working with all of these folks to, to prepare their grant and submit it to us. So to apply for the cost share grant, you know, you have to use the geomorphic uh, approach. In that, you have to fill out the geomorphic assessment form. That's going to be key information. And then the project must address the river channel stability and fish passage. Those are key words. And then bridge and or culvert replacement must be designed for both channel and floodplain. As I mentioned earlier, you know, it all acts as a one unit. And as a one unit, we have to uh, design the opening for the channel. And then we have to be designing the opening for the floodplain based on the bank for metrics. And the collaboration uh, with EWR staff and road design team to, do, to develop a least impactful site design. We're not going to achieve natural conditions. They're always going to be embankments uh, and fill. Uh, we can make it least impactful by, for example, uh, you know, reach um, a sediment condition that is less than the critical uh, shear stress, for example. Uh, once we are less than the critical shear stress, then the sediment transfer would be allowable. So, so there are some design objectives that we can, uh, you know, meet uh, to say that you know it's it's uh, it's a very good application. And then accept the project will require standard deliverables discussed with EWR staff and design team. And this is important that we keep on reviewing throughout the stages of the project, especially when the area hydrologists have to issue permits. You know, they they would have to make sure that you know all the requirements are met. So this is sort of a flow chart that we envisioned, you know, back when we were preparing for this. Basically review the and score, you know, we would review the uh, uh, geomorphic assessment form and, and the design, make sure they're compatible. And then we have a scoring criteria that we develop in-house and I'll mention it later. And then after that, we will basically give a tentative agreement that you have, your site uh, looks good and it does apply to your geomorphic approach as we review it. So now they will prepare for their preliminary design and then the cost estimate. And once we get the cost estimate, we formalize the agreement and then we get the final design and then we go through the permitting construction. And, you know, Kevin and I and our team consisting of, you know, Dan O'Shea, uh, Steve Kloiber and Amanda Hillman and the area hydrologist, we will work with you along these steps to make sure that everything's been complied with.
and on, then after we get the post construction and as build drawings, then we would reimburse the 25% of the bid cost. That's how we envisioned it. And this is what we're doing right now. We're finding out that there's a lot of preparation before we actually get the grant application. That's when we work with the different communities who ask us, you know, does this site work? We have this site over here. Does it need it? So we end up doing like the geomorphic assessment in-house, the preliminary modeling in-house, looking at it, say, yep, it does meet it. Go ahead and if they agree to it, go ahead and submit the grant. So there's a lot of back and forth. It's not as smooth as we envision. Maybe we can modify it next year, but it's very site specific because we work with every site individually. You know, we want every site to make it. So, so and each uh, site, um, you know, requires meetings, involvements, and and uh, sharing of technical information and things like that. So I mentioned the review criteria. It's based on five uh, major things. The first one is the channel stability, uh, which is the degree of channel incision, and then the fish passage. Uh, the, those to receive the highest point. You know, the most unstable the channel is, the the more there is a barrier, the higher it's going to score because you want to fix the problem. Also, safety. That's when we consider the special flood hazard area, the the emergency route, uh, FEMA conditions, structural impairments and environmental justice and equity considerations, and, and we provide like an EPA environmental justice screen. And there's some other special considerations, like is this part of a watershed plan? Do we have an endangered species in mind that we really want to address? Is it part of a restoration system? That's really important. Is there a consecutive crossings, like I showed with Traverse County? And we're actually working, we're going to we plan to be involved, the one in our tale that we met about last week, uh, you know, that involves a consecutive crossing. So these are all different special considerations that we want to consider to, you know, increase the score. And then for the aquatic barrier review, we based it on guidelines that um, uh, Luther, uh, Adland, and Amanda Hillman put together back in December 2015. It basically ranks the channel into different barriers. If it's a complete barrier, you know, that means there's no fish passage that usually scores the highest uh, because that's why we, we want to be uh, able to fix the problem. And then th there's a significant partial passable dry. Sometimes we don't get any information at all and we, we give it like a flat score overall. So the more information we get, the higher the score would be if you can make the case that it does cause a barrier for fish passage. And then we use the EPA environmental justice screen you know, to to address the the location of the site and if it serves like a you know low income community, uh, underserved community, um, you know we we usually assign uh, more points for that. I want to mention also that if you submit the geomorphic approach, FEMA will uh, as part of a LOMAR study, FEMA will waive the fees for both CLOMAR and LOMAR, and and you know based on the language that FEMA believes that the general projects where the primary purpose is habitat and for restoration and that's really key habitat restoration in the project is funded in whole or in part with federal or state funds would meet the fee exemption for habitat restoration as described in the HFIAA which is the Homeland Flood Insurance Affordability Act 2014 so they agreed after reviewing our approach that the geomorphic approach will meet this exemption but it's a case by case that you have to prove that you know you are improving habitat restoration and you can do it when you talk about terrestrial and aquatic passage that's sort of the underlining benefit of using this and of course you cannot build another bridge as part of it you can do a restoration with it and primary bridge culvert replacement project that involve this approach with minimal other road work they don't want to see other development work involved and there's some other funding sources you know fema has grants the Section 46 is part of the Stafford Act. You know, they assign grant funds for state to use, uh, you know, during storm area situations. And then, of course, the Minnesota incentive, uh, clean water cost share that I mentioned, the, also the infrastructure bill that are being added. So there's a lot of that. And the point here is, you know, the cost share grant can be used in, in combination with other. It could be you can use it with federal. You can use it with other clean water funds. You can use, use it with uh, even FEMA funds uh, as long as you're not like, you know, double dipping or overlapping uh, goals. So you have to check the requirements of the other bills. And there's some a lot of resources out there. You know, the Water Talk, uh, thanks to SEAL, uh, we were able to uh, you know publish a lot of 
uh, articles, you know, from 2014 until the present in the water talk. So it does show like the progression of our work, you know, as it evolved in, in 10 years now. And of course, you can go to the website. And I summarized here the water talk articles uh, that you can actually go and, and read more, you know, to familiarize yourself. It talks about, you know, um, sort of the principles of why it's needed. Uh, why do they make sense? Uh, how do they address floodplain connectivity? Uh, when we, we announced the FEMA, FEMA waiver, it talks in details about the conditions of how you can do it in, in your own FEMA submittals. And then we start doing case studies when we see it applied in like the Watton one uh, for one of, in Riverdale Township. And, and that was a successful story there. Uh, and then SRF and Hennepin County worked with the city of Cochran and uh, there were other players involving us too, where we actually applied the geomorphic approach. We, we highlighted that. And then the recent one is in November 2023 when we talked about the grant announcement for the Culver Bridge replacement geomorphic approach. So I hope you learn a lot from this. And, and the key thing is, you know, give us some sites to work with. Uh, if you see them and share them with us, we will work with you. We will start doing the technical assistance part and, and then hopefully put you on the list, uh, you know, to apply for the grant application uh, down the road. That's our objective is to make sure that this uh, cost share program is going to be successful and it's already is and we want to make it even more successful. We want to have more sites than money available so that we can go there and say, you know, it's in demand. People want to apply it. Please give us some more money. You know, and, and hopefully that happens. And and that concludes the presentation. And I think I gave 15 minutes for yeah, any. You, did, you were aiming for 45 minute presentation and you met your goal. Okay, hey, I'm not seeing any more questions. But again, we'll hang around for a few more minutes if others think of questions. And you can always email us. And we would be happy to. You know, answer any question you have or any information that you need. Getting information on what those cost differences are, hopefully we'll, we'll get more of those examples and yeah. be able to give better ranges. Yeah, that's going to be key because we need like sort of an economical analysis and that's going to be good data for us to have and work with. Right. And we hope to work with SAFL even more uh, as they're doing experiments and, and uh, that's going to be really key also.